All right, so you have chosen a Kubernetes component. I'm Will Button, this is DevOps for Developers. That's the dog leaving the room right there. And so you chose this video wanting to know about Kubernetes components, right? So Kubernetes, I know you've heard the term, it's like this raging popular thing, gives you a way to manage and deploy your applications. Well, what does that really mean? So at a high level, let's say that you build your badass website and you deploy it, and then you decide to go out and hang out with your friends and your web server crashes. And so now it's down, but you're out and possibly don't know that. Well, Kubernetes is gonna be watching that. So whenever you launch your app, it's gonna see it crash and it's gonna be like, oh, dang, there's nobody else around. Um... I'm just gonna restart it. And so it'll restart it for you. Like at a really, really high level, that's what it does. Now it also does some things like scaling. So whenever your web web server starts getting a lot of traffic in, it will identify the fact that the, the service there is not keeping up. And so it will launch more services to handle the load and scale them back in and all those kind of things, which are all really cool features. But in order to take advantage of any of those, you kind of got to have some background information as to what Kubernetes or how Kubernetes does that. And that's what we're going to cover in this video. All right, so let's look at what a Kubernetes cluster looks like from a really high level. We've got some different components here. And this image is actually just from Kubernetes website. It perfectly explains what we're going to talk about here. So I saw no need to recreate it but we've got this control plane thing here, and then we've got the nodes. So let's go through each of those and talk about what they are. So first of all, the control plane, that's like the brains of the operation. It's the one that manages everything in the cluster. It organizes the work, it tells who is gonna be doing what, and it sends out orders whenever things are not in the desired state, right? got a couple of components that we're concerned about here. There's a ton of components, but there's only a couple that we're really concerned about to understand the high level operation of Kubernetes. Now, the first part is the Kube API server. If you've ever run a Kube control command, something like Kube control get nodes, and it returns the list of nodes, you've actually just interacted with the Kube API server, all right? So the Kube API server, will um, take the, it, it exposes the Kube Kubernetes API. So it allows you to interact with the cluster, right? Um, another key component of Kubernetes is etcd. And so etcd is where everything is stored about Kubernetes for your cluster, like the nodes, um, the configuration, um, the, the IP addressing, all that kind of stuff. Everything that means anything to Kubernetes is stored in etcd, so it's obviously very important, and it's also critical that you protect that data. Now, the other piece of the control plane that's worth mentioning is the scheduler. So whenever you give Kubernetes a new task, like run my web server, it will look at the resources you're requesting and then schedule that to be executed on a node that meets the requirements that you've defined. So a very important part of getting your applications to run on the right nodes, especially if you have some nodes that provide certain resources and other nodes that don't have those resources. Now, the other part of Kubernetes is the nodes themselves. That's where the actual work takes place. In a normal Kubernetes, cluster, the server running your control plane is not going to be running your workload on it. You kind of want it off, just focused on its primary task. So the work actually gets executed on the nodes. And if you saw the video leading up to this one, you saw that we built out our controller here and then built out three different nodes where we can execute our work. So there's some different components that we want to talk about here. First of all, every node, which can be a physical server, it can be a virtual machine, um, it can be like an EC2 instance if you're using AWS, but either way, it runs the kubelet application, right? And so the kubelet is the one that manages the containers in the pods. And we'll get to what containers in pods are here in just about a minute. 
But basically, you've got this list of containers that are supposed to be running on the node. And so the kubelet will continuously probe those looking for your health checks and the resource utilization and make sure that they are in the state that you've defined. And if not, it will take some form of action to bring it back to that state. The other part of the node is the cube proxy, right? And so the cube proxy is like the networking layer. So there's all types of communication going on in Kubernetes. There's communication between the control plane and the nodes. Uh, there's communication sometimes between pods, and you can even have communication between containers within a pod. And so the cube proxy is the guy that makes all of that happen seamlessly. Last but not least, and not shown on the diagram, unfortunately, but we'll deal with it, is the container runtime, right? So you're gonna be giving these nodes different containers to run, and so it needs a runtime in order to understand how to run that container. The one that everyone's familiar with is Docker, but that's not your only option. You can also be using container D or uh, one of the CRI container runtime initiative. I think that's the right acronym for it. Um, CRI compatible runtimes. And so there are a few of those out there. Generally, you're gonna see Docker most commonly. Container D probably is the second most common. But either way, it's a way for that node to know when you give it a container what it's actually supposed to do with it. And so the last thing that I think is worth pointing out for a high level understanding of Kubernetes is DNS, which is not really um, a core component until you try to run Kubernetes without it. All right, so we've got, um, if we take a look at the screen here, this is the cluster that I built in the last video. Oh, and it doesn't work until I give it focus. Uh, we can actually see that there is a pod called Core DNS running here that was installed. Um, if you watched that video, it was whenever I did the microcates enable DNS. This is the container that got installed. And so DNS is used by, um, used by Kubernetes for communication within the system just to make it easier. And nobody wants to remember 6,000 IP addresses, so we'll just use DNS. And if you want to see where that's running within the K9S application here, you can hit the D command and that will describe that container or describe that pod. I'm sorry, it's a pod, not a container. And we'll get into the difference between that in just a second here, but it'll pull it up and it will show you um, everything that it knows about that. It shows you the namespace. Uh, specifically, one of the things that we might be interested in is the pod or the node where it's running, which should be here. Where is that? Oh yeah, right up at the top. So yeah, so it's running on the WADN node two. So might be helpful to know for whatever reason, but more importantly, that's our DNS system. That is a very much desired uh, application to have in your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, let's dig in a little bit deeper into the last component we're gonna talk about in this video, which is the node and the things inside of it, specifically the pods. So I just mentioned that the node is the virtual machine or the physical instance that provides the work for our Kubernetes cluster. Each of those runs a kubelet and also the container runtime application, whether that's Docker or Container D or something similar like that. And then it's told, hey, run this specific pod. And now a pod is just a wrapper around one or more containers. Let's think of it like this, going back to our website analogy that we started the video off with. You've got a website, let's say it runs on Nginx. You could build a pod that runs an Nginx container where container refers to the Docker style containers that we're familiar with as your website. So the pod's gonna say, hey, here's this container, make sure it's running, dude, and that's it. But it doesn't have to be just that one container. It could be actually be multiple containers that make up your application and they can all be in the same pod, right? So let's say that you have an Nginx portion of your website that holds the static part of your content, but you also have a backend API and you want that packaged in the same pod as well. 
uh, and that runs Node.js. So you could have two containers in there, one container running your Nginx application and one container running your Node.js application. And so you're gonna have health checks for each of those. And if either of those um, doesn't respond or crashes or whatever, then Kubernetes is going to restart that pod. So when it comes to scaling your application, one way that you could approach this would be just adding more containers to your pod. And that would be wrong. We wouldn't wanna do that. We actually want to scale by increasing the number of pods, not the number of things in a pod. So we would define our application as a pod containing two containers, one container with Nginx, one container with our Node.js application. And to scale that, we wanna increase the number of pods. And now those pods can be scheduled on different nodes across your Kubernetes application. All right, so the last thing that I'm gonna mention in this video about nodes are persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. So think of it like this, your application has to write data somewhere or it has to read data somewhere. Well, you don't wanna bundle that inside the container, right? Because we all know that data written inside a container will be lost. So the Kubernetes way of addressing that is with persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. And I struggled to wrap my head around this in the beginning. So I'm gonna see if I can explain it to you and save you that frustration. A persistent volume, think of that as the disk storage medium itself. Now that could be um, a dedicated hard drive, it could be an NFS share, it could be um, some cloud storage, whether that's like a Amazon EBS volume or an EFS volume or any of those types of things. It's basically the place where the data finally lives, and that's represented in Kubernetes as a persistent volume. But in order for a pod, and therefore the containers in that pod, to access it, it has to claim it, right? And that's where persistent volume claims come in. So within your application, you're gonna, um, you're gonna define a persistent volume claim and that claim is gonna match up to one of the persistent volumes defined in your Kubernetes cluster. So whenever that pod comes up and comes online, it's gonna take its claim and go, hey, I'm looking for a dude with these specs and Kubernetes is gonna go, oh, hey, this dude's got those specs, you guys should talk. And so then that persistent volume is now claimed, so it can't be used anywhere else. That's a really high level um, description of it, but I think it will get you going and give you enough background information to move on to the next step of actually implementing some of this stuff. So if I've done my math right, that's putting this video right around 10 minutes, and I don't really wanna go too much longer than that, um, just because, it, it just gets muddy after that, right? And I think this is a good stopping point because from here, I think a really good place to go next would be to check out the next video on launching Jenkins. I've actually got a video where I deploy Jenkins on Kubernetes. So you'll get to learn a little bit about Jenkins, how Jenkins operates, the way that I recommend that you run it. And then ultimately towards the end of that video, running it on Kubernetes. And that's where you're going to see a lot of these Kubernetes concepts get solidified, right? So don't worry that there were a lot of terms here. You're going to forget what they are. You know, you're going to hear the word um, node or pod and be like, oh, shit, what was that? Um, it'll start to make sense as you get familiar with it. I'm breaking all of this stuff down into chapters. So bookmark this video. And when you hit one of those terms and you can't remember what it is, come back to this video, hit that section of the video using the chapter links. And I think that will get you up and running. And um, I'll see y'all in the next video. Yay. Is that all I was gonna say about that? That seems kind of short. Oh, scaling. Now the other part of <laughs> it felt like I was going somewhere with that, but I totally lost it. Yeah, good times. Uh, it's not a touch screen, dude. You can't touch it. <laughs>